Now the cool thing about planting food plots is you don't need a lot of equipment to do so. Uh, food plotting is not farming, farming is not food plotting. Someone asked me, you know, I made a comment and I, I didn't want it to be offensive towards farmers or towards food plotters, but you know, I've written a food plot book, a food plot web class. I've designed over 1,100 food plots programs in 26 states. I've uh, been doing this for a long time. I've, I feel I've innovated a lot of food plot planting methods that maybe someone else thought of long ago, but it wasn't in print, it wasn't uh, on TV, um, certainly wasn't online, anything like that. So, you know, I've really been into this for a very long time. First started planting food plots in, in 95. I know some of you've been planting them longer, but you don't really need a lot of equipment. And when it comes to farming, they're using big equipment, big plots, big areas. Um, standard practices, um, corn, bean, cash crop rotations. Hey, food plant is different. You're using different combinations of foods, different planting timing. How many farmers are planting right now, the end of July, early August, for their majority of their food plots? I'm planting all my plots, you know, 18 to 20 acres in, in two states, helping a friend. So I have 18 acres of my own, and then I help a friend a little bit with his. Um, we planted those plots the years prior. The bottom line is the food plot strategy is different than farming, of course. Um, the equipment that you can use and get away with for food plotting is a lot different than farming. The size of the plots, the access to the plots, all of that's completely different. You know, often poorer soils, poorer soil, soil types you're dealing with. So it's completely different. And one thing that's great, again, about food plotting is you can get away with a lot smaller equipment. And uh, it's more accessible to the everyday person. A lot of people say, well, you know, food plotting is too much. You, you put too much into into deer hunting, and I'll tell you what, owning private land and planting food plots is a heck of a lot harder than hunting on private land. I love hunting private land every year, and I often talk about that when I hunt uh, public land, but I, when I hunt public land, I, I can relax. I'm picking where I wanna hunt, I'm going in and sit, sitting down. Uh, maybe I'm hiking here and there, but it's just hiking, looking for sign during the season. It's just different. Uh, private land, you have to consider so many things because you're trying to take that movement that might be over a couple miles on public land and condense it into 80 acres or 200 acres. It takes a special type of work and strategy and planning far different on private land versus public. I love to relax when I hunt on public land. That's me. I, like, I don't care if I walk in an hour and a half, that's relaxing to me. Food plotting, managing private land, all that you can do on private land is a lot different, but bottom line is you don't have to have much equipment. And even then leasing, you know, there's been a lot of years now we do pretty well. We've been blessed with the business and um, the exposure and um, the different ways that we can bring in income. That was not the case 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, you know, I was a, a real estate appraiser in my previous life. My license I let run out in 2010. I started the whitetail business in 05. They were full-time businesses in 08, 09, and 10. I should have started earlier, I often say, on my whitetail business in 08 and just made that jump. But it was a really big jump, scary jump, uh, to make that into the hunting industry full-time, which I did in 2010. And, uh, and I've enjoyed that entire process but what I found was I could go lease land for just a fraction of what it cost to own that land. You know, we leased one land. It was it was uh, it actually sold for six hundred thousand somewhere on there. We leased it for between twenty five and thirty five hundred dollars per year for twelve years. And so yeah, we paid. I want you to do the math real quick here. Forty thousand dollars, something like that, over the entire thirty five to forty thousand dollars over that entire twelve year period. Um, but that that paled in comparison to the $600,000 price tag to actually buy that land. Let alone our payments for one month would have been similar to what do we lease for for the entire year. And I'm not even including taxes and other work we do on the property because we owned it. So leasing is a poor man's way of getting on private land. And for that, I didn't have an expensive fishing boat or a fishing boat at all. I didn't have expensive vehicles or multiple vehicles, toys. I didn't have those things. And I lived in more of a modest house. And um, couldn't afford my acreage, you know, that I had at that time. So it was, or I wanted to have at that time. So leasing was a good option in, in order to be able to hunt. And then when you added in food plots, it really didn't cost that much. We didn't have to use great equipment for, there's a lot of ways to get it done. And that's where a lot of these areas are born out of. It's just trying to make it more efficient, cheap, easy, and still have great results. Talk about one of the things that key with all no-till plots is soil exposure. So if you're gonna throw a seed on soil, and I'm not even talking about no-till drills. That's different, that's no-till planting, but I'm talking about no-till planting without big expensive machinery, including no-till drills. So soil exposure is key. 
Now I didn't add it on here, but even this time of year, it's early August, there's fields out there where you walk into and because of the quality of the soil, lack of quality of soil, or how long it hasn't been planted, you can just kick the ground and see the soil, it's right there. So if you get a spring on it right now and you get a spring on in a month, then to get rye seed down into there, or even a tillage radish that's fast growing, even buckwheat seed that you just want something green to pop up really quick, or a combination of each one of those, you can get those growing really fast and get those onto the soil. So it might even be right now in early August, you can spray right now, mix of Roundup and 2,4-D, two quarts per acre of, of Roundup and one pint per acre of 2,4-D, get a good kill. Then you're throwing your seed down four or five weeks from now, that seed's getting onto the soil. You're spraying at the same time with two quarts per acre of glyphosate, not 2,4-D, because any of your broad leaves it'll kill because that 2,4-D stays in the soil for a while. So you can spray glyphosate on there, which is generic Roundup, it's the chemical in Roundup, and, uh, and get a good kill that second kill and now those seeds can actually grow with sunlight getting down into them because all the vegetation has been killed and drying out but again you have to get the seed on the soil and that's where this easy no-till process starts. Ed Spinazzola, he was a father of modern food plotting as I'd like to say back in the 90s and he talked about a process where he would spray three times during the year and then he'd frost seed clover the next year. Well, I look at it, I took it a step different to 98. I looked at it like if I have open soil going into the fall, that's a sin. I'm not waiting until next year to frost seed clover into, that's probably not even be a good hunting season drawing anyways, or do much for the deer herd. I want seed on the ground in the fall. So I took Ed's process and expanded it to where I plant in the fall. I first planted with a mix of rye, oats, and then put clover in there. So I had that clover base the following year, but then I had that hunting season draw too. Unlike frost seeding, where you have to get that, that really important kill right before fall, because that allows you to plant into a lack of competition the following spring. In my process, the easy no-till process, you have to uh, spray first in the spring, usually end of April, May, sometime, when those weeds are eight, 10 inches high, 15 inches high, but not 20 inches or two feet high, because you're eliminating future weed debris and that allows you to get the seed on the soil. Again, going back to that soil contact later in the summer. So you're spraying first, end of April, again, early June, again, mid-July, and the soil will be open enough. We do that, we did that this year on our 67 acres the new property. We did that last year on a new property here in Minnesota and then we added the 67 acres this year. It seems like every year I'm creating new plots somewhere and I'm using this process to a exceptionally high defined rate of success with very little failure ever. And what's nice about that is you spray three times, you open up the soil, and we even got peas on the soil, oats on the soil this year, so big seeds, buckwheat, easy to get down onto the soil let alone Nebraska. So very effective method for you. You just have to make sure you start early. That first sp spring is most important. And what you'll find is you don't have to use much spray the second and third spray because most of the weeds are dead. First spring, I'm usually using a combination of two quarts per acre glyphosate, one pint per acre of 2,4-D. And then the second, third spray, I'm just using glyphosate. And sometimes I'm cutting that in half because there's so few weeds on the, uh, on the area of food plot that you're using. And then I'm throwing that seed on the soil. I like using the Packer Max call the packer to call the packet in. Tires from the ATV, tires from the side by side, whatever it might be. I'm throwing that seed on the ground and I'm timing that a lot of times with my third spring. So I'm throwing the seed on the ground and then spraying. Don't ever fear that. I've been doing that for over 20 years. Very easy process and very successful. I've planted literally hundreds of acres of food plots in combination by doing that and uh, with little to no crop failure. Now my ultimate no-till, this is born out of trying to improve poor soil and rotating the buckwheat and rye. And so that started in the early 2000s where I'm planting buckwheat and then instead of tilling it in, disking it in and having to spend that time to do so, I'm simply spreading the seed. I planted my lawn in the mid 2000s this way by planting the seed right into the standing buckwheat and then call the packing it and then spraying. The spraying is critical. The spraying is critical because it keeps that buckwheat down and keeps it competing from especially the small seeds. It might not bother the uh, peas in the mix, the beans, the oats, but it will bother the brassica and in fact keep it from germinating because that buckwheat won't disintegrate and it'll half be alive. And some people said, well, you call the pack twice, you don't have to spray. Well, what about all the broadleafs that are in that buckwheat? Again, you're trying to control 
weeds as well. Someone said, well, you have to think about the pollinators. You know, there's a lot of flowers in those buckwheat, so I didn't want to spray them. Well, you're just crushing them and killing them anyways. At the same time, this is a plow down crop. You know, you're in the ground for six to eight uh, weeks to eight weeks. And I always can uh, encourage diversity on your land. You know, we have a lot of pollinators out here. We have bee balm. We have some of the cones that are out there. Our goldenrod starting to actually bloom right now. So we have lots of pollinators around here. They don't have to have our buckwheat. And if your pollinators on your property are your buckwheat that's only planted for six weeks, you really need to diversify your habitat a lot more than that than just having flowering buckwheat as your only pollinator on your property. That's a bad habitat right here. I, I always preach a lot more diversity than that. Bottom line is that ultimate no-till blend is excellent because you can smash that buckwheat down on top of those big seeds, those small seeds. It disintegrates quickly when you spray it. You kill your weeds. Buckwheat's a smother crop anyways. So you're left with bare soil, great seed to soil contact because those stems are only about four or five inches apart. That's why you seed first, call the pack second. I spray and call the pack at the same time. That works really well with the ATV, pulling the Packer Max behind it, spraying every other row. So you're spraying, I have a 40 inch boom on the back of the ATV, which is perfect. That's the same width as the Packer Max or right around there. And so it's very compact, but I eliminate the need to call the pack and then spray with different equipment. I do it all at the same time. So it works really well. Um, I encourage you, those Packer Maxes have been awesome. I like them because they're not the cheap steel that you buy for the typical ATV called the Packer that fails in the first, was it the first time, Dylan? Yeah. Yeah, the first time we used it, I won't even mention a brand or anything, but we used it the first time and it broke. So it uh, it wasn't a good, I think that was 2016. I was so excited to use that little thing and we flopped it out of the truck and used it for two minutes and it broke. So um, let alone those plates, it's pot metal. And that's why the polyethylene tank with the Packer Max, very durable. It's got a great axle on it, heavy duty frame. And uh, it lasts for a very long time. We put them through our paces uh, incredibly and we've been very happy. But that's another option for you. It involves planting the buckwheat in the spring, a lot of times into staining rye. And that rye, as long as it's not going to seed head, the rye gives you a lot of space too, a lot of ground exposure. It's, again, you can look at it and you're getting 40% soil exposure because you're laying that buckwheat down. It sends up a good leader because it's a big seed. The, sm the smaller the seed, the shorter the leader, the smaller. And the bigger the seed, the bigger the leader when it shoots up that first initial phase of growth. And so you can actually spread it into your rye as long as it's not going to seed head. You can crush the rye with a just simple call the packer, spray at the same time, and you get great germination on the buckwheat. Then you're spreading the seed in the buckwheat at the timing of your fall crops. Hero grains more September to late September, depending if you're north or south. And then also brassica and greens, peas, late planted beans, light oats, even tilled radish on a, on a bare soil plot first time uh, more early to end of August with that timing. So you're allowing the timing of the fall crop to determine when you seed. And I like to, on good soil, let that buckwheat grow for about six weeks if once you get germination. And on bad soil, you're looking at more eight, nine weeks. And, uh, and then the, the thing about this, all of this is, let's say you have small plots and you're eight, the buckwheat down to the dirt, you had drought, well just throw a bunch of rye on it during the, during the fall and enjoy the season. Throw brassica on it in the early August, uh, mid-August, depending on where you're at, and enjoy the season. Use cereal grains on one side, brassica on the other. You still have options, even if your buckwheat failed. The buckwheat's great because it's smother crop, builds the soil, um, makes it so you don't have to rip up the soil, creates a greenhouse effect down by the soil, so keep it damp. So there's a lot of benefits to the buckwheat, but if the buckwheat fails, pick up one of these, pick up the easy no-till process and use that. So there's always an option, and if all else fails, you're layering rye in September and enjoying the season. Late rye, corn, and beans. This worked really well for us because we specifically left some rye that was five feet tall. And we did that to show people, if I have standing rye, I get this question all the time, what do I do? They didn't address it, they didn't kill it, they didn't mow it early in the spring. And I'm, I, I encourage you to uh, terminate the rye sometime in late May through end of June, sometime around there. But bottom line, if it's standing, we planted no-till uh, Roundup Ready beans and corn just into the staining rye. We crush it down with a call to packer, followed up with urea on it. I actually did that today. And then we'll spray too to eliminate the rye seed heads that are now starting to germinate. You always have to plant on that because if you plant brassica into the staining rye or some other crop, that rye can, it's, it's got a weed suppressant. So it'll fight and really outcompete a lot of the different types of seed plantings that are in that staining rye. 
So we crushed that down, beans and corn, about three weeks ago. And now the beans and corn are doing great. We need to feed them with some nitrogen. And then we need to actually spray the Roundup glyphosate to kill that rye that's coming up in there. We're not going to kill it all because those seed heads have a tendency to lay there. Some will get down in the soil, germinate at different times. We're going to eliminate it enough so there's no competition for the beans and corn. And that's why we use a Roundup Ready variety so that we can actually plant into that pretty late for the corn but we could have planted corn mid to late june with that method and done the same exact thing and had a good crop we use the 85 day uh, corn most of my plots were planted either uh, my corn plots are either uh, june 24th or july 5th those two weeks apart and they're all doing great we're going to expect a lot of corn this year but bottom line that's an option for you you have that rye standing it's eliminated weeds we have smart weed on our property in coon valley and they call it smart weed i think because it easily avoids most chemicals it's a pain in the butt and so um, we've diminished it i had extra sprayings over there 24d a couple times and uh but what's interesting is the areas that had a lot of rye last year on that half of the plot it's eliminated or reduced the smart weed because it has that weed suppressor shaded it out out competed so rye can out compete weeds it can also out compete your crops so always keep that in mind but that is an option if you have that late standing rye spring beans and rye or wheat and there's people doing this out in different systems right now but always look at this is chapter 12 in my 2014 food plot book i talk about using standing rye in may to early june end of may early june spreading that roundup ready soybean into it call the packing and having great luck with that happening you can even look up on google articles that i wrote back then but it was in 2014 started writing that book a year earlier but uh, chapter 12 of that food plot book. And um, that's a method that's worked really well, just using Roundup Ready Beans. Maybe you're in an area where I want to increase a deer population. Great option. Maybe you're in an area where you have excessive weed control problems. And so you need to plant that, that Roundup Ready Bean and you can work on your plots all summer long, spraying glyphosate, killing it, and enjoying the season. So it is an option, but it works really well. And then finally, ag field brassica and greens. This is where you have that ag production and you're waiting for those beans to start to turn brown. Hopefully by the end of August, you can get that brassica crop into it. And then of course, mid-September to late September, you can always go in there 200 pounds of winter rye or wheat or both and get a great cereal grain crop. And it's not gonna hinder the, the harvesting of those beans or anything else. You can get that crop in there. Again, if all else fails, throw that rye into it in late uh, to mid September and you're doing that in standing soybeans. So pretty easy to do in those ag fields. You can even do that in corn. You go through there in October, you can spread that rye. The leaves are starting to turn yellow and mature. Sunlight's getting down there. And even after the farmer harvests that crop, you can still have that standing crop of rye and that puts nutrients back in the soil the following spring. To plant into bonus something that's easy to do my favorite way to plant switchgrass is by frost seeding your frost seeded switchgrass will grow but you have to eliminate weeds i've had machine planted various types of uh, uh, grain drills plant switchgrass and what i found my best plantings are always the plantings that i throw myself onto the exposed soil because of good weed control and then i mow as needed and i allow that crop to come in of switchgrass it's a very effective way. We had a lot of drought in areas this year and people complain, well, it didn't grow. Well, folks, those seeds are in the soil and if you control the weeds, they will come up. Switchgrass is one of the most hardy seeds that you can plant. When you're laying on the soil, it will germinate at some point. So if you give up on it, you're giving up. That's a very bad decision on your part because you've invested the money in the seed. You just have to take a little bit of extra time to mow that, to make sure that there's no weed competition. And it's amazing that switchgrass, how it pops up in year two or three on something that you might have even given up on. So always make sure that with switchgrass, you keep in mind it will germinate unless it's underwater or unless it gets shaded out by competition because you didn't do a good job either with weed control or mowing. It will come in and it's a very dependable way to do that. And the cool thing is about all of this, except for the ag field beans, but again, you're just planting with a broadcaster, is you can do this no-till very easy with very little equipment. I've done this with as little as a backpack sprayer back in 99, 2000, spraying 
and then seeding into it. Just for a quick reference, I use the Earthway model 2750. I'm not sponsored or partnered with them in any way. It's just what I've used for 20 years. It's a vinyl bag, so most of the time it stays up so you can at least pour the seed in. If it's a cloth bag, it doesn't. Buckets are very cumbersome to throw around. I like putting seed into that bag. I stuff it in there, throw it over my shoulder, go. I can throw it flat on an ATV or in a side-by-side. -side. It doesn't roll around. Easier just to throw over my shoulder and go as opposed to strapping this thing on. One and a half with brassica mixtures that have a good amount of tilled radish in it. If it's just brassica, it might be more like one and a quarter on the setting. The green blends we use, the WHS green blend from Northwoods Whitetails, or blends like that that we'll have with the easy no-till uh, blend maybe next year. Those are more like four and a half to five. I put out heavy seed. Switchgrass, more like 1.5. And while we're at it, I throw a lot of urea on my corn and different things that I'm growing around the property of my brassicas. And I'm finding that right around three for a setting, three and a half is great for heavy urea to throw that fertilizer on brassica or corn that I want to grow. So those are some of those settings with the earthway spreader if you're taking notes there um, that work really well. And I'm even gone to as high as just five or a little bit above on those bigger WHS green blends where we have peas, oats, late planted beans, maybe some tillage radish added to that. So consider those, those different settings for the earthway, but consider you have to get the seed on the soil. You can't just throw this on a lawn. Someone told me with the ultimate no-till that it didn't work. And I said, well, what, how big was the brass or the buckwheat? You know, how um, was it mature? Did it do well? And they said, well, I just threw it on my lawn. Folks, that's not the ultimate no-till. Ultimate no-till involves buckwheat. You know, it involves buckwheat, 50 pounds per acre because the buckwheat stems are about four, five, six inches apart and they give plenty of soil exposure so that when you plant your seed into the standing buckwheat, the seed falls on the soil and then you crush the buckwheat over it like a quarter to eight, eighth inch, half inch of soil on top of that seed, get great germination rates. And if you follow the steps with each one of these processes and you can look these up on my YouTube channel, just type in these search words. You can use the YouTube search um, for any whitetail strategy content for my videos, they'll top, they'll pop up in the top three or four or five or one or two spots, but they'll always be on that first page for whatever strategy you're looking for. So if you have a question about anything, uh, hunting hills and thermals, whatever it might be, not only do we might not ha we might have a playlist for that, but then at the same time, um, it'll likely come up right up on top in that search for anything whitetail. We have almost 800 videos out there. And uh, along with Google, too, I have over 600 uh, articles on my site. So uh, if you have any questions, I urge you to search for that. I urge you to subscribe if you really like whitetail strategy content that's been proven and around for decades and actually shows results. And I thank you for watching. Enjoy one of these no-till plots. They were built out of and designed out of making sure that you didn't have to spend as much money, as much effort, that you're efficient with your time, and then at the same time, you still have those exceptional results. And in a lot of cases, better results than actually tilling up the soil, drying it out, creating erosion concerns, and bringing more weeds to the surface. Enjoy these processes this year, next year, and beyond. Well, I'm real excited, folks. I appreciate you watching this video. But my next web class, How to Plant Food Plots, How to Design Your Food Plot Program, is out. And uh, it really goes through a step-by-step -step process for not only how to plant your food plots, but why you should plant them, where you should plant them, what you should plant, how you should create them. There's a lot of different modules. Ends up about 30 videos all together. I urge you to check that out. We're out here completing our food plot work today, and we do that in a pretty strict pattern so we can find success this fall. Food plots shouldn't be a guessing game take the guesswork out of food plots and food plots planting and uh, and check out the web classes. I have my how to design your whitetail property, the food plots for the next web class in the series. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you check it out and uh, let me know what you think if you uh, end up purchasing that and I think you'd be well pleased that you did.